Join us in the Alex Salmon Show in the beautiful English city of Bath. In these genteel surroundings, I've come to interview Scotland's most controversial and successful political blogger. Wings over Scotland, the Reverend Stuart Cabell. Hear what he's got to say on air, online, on the Alex Salmon Show. So Stuart, now that we're, we're sitting down, Tell me about this reverent business and the dog collar. I mean, what's what's it all about? Yeah, oh, that's a that's an odd one. I mean, partly it's just a it's just a bit of fun. It really winds some people up. But I, I originally um, started doing it because, firstly, just to make myself easier to find on the internet. Because obviously, Stuart Campbell's a, a really common name. There's millions of people. If you search for Stuart Campbell, there's there was a Scotland rugby player, a footballer. There's a famous there's a canoeist. There's a famous gynaecologist of all sorts of people. So by by becoming Reverend Stuart Campbell, I'm the only one of those. <laughs> but I also I also had, used to have a lot of trouble. This still when I was a video game journalist before politics, uh, I used to get trouble with people who didn't like my video games journalism, sort of sabotaging uh, things like my Wikipedia page, because there was also a, there was a, a horrible murderer guy called Stuart Campbell. He killed some a young lassie, Danielle Jones, I think her name might have been, and people used to sabotage my Wikipedia page by linking any references to me to the page of this murderer guy. So it was partly to, to stop that happening, to, to distinguish myself from him and generally from other... Not, not because you're a Ricky Fulton fan, and well, I am jolly, because yeah. I noticed your recent fundraiser, you've, you've heard Last Call, you've, uh, you've introduced that as, come on, you're the secrets at Ricky Fulton. Ah, oh, there's no secret about that, Alex. I mean, every, every decent Scottish person is a, is a big Ricky Fulton fan. But yeah, we, we've repurposed Last Call for our fundraiser this year, and I mean, I, I grew up with Ricky Fulton. I've seen him live lots of times. My, my granny uh, in Condorit used to take me to pantomimes at the pavilion with people like him and the Alexander brothers and Glenn Michael. Something so let's, like let, let's dispense with the, the dog collar hmm. before the, the unionist press says that you were impersonating a, a good reverend in the Alex Salmon show. I think we've had quite enough fun with him as it is. How did the Wings Over Scotland get started? Well, yeah, I mean, as you say, after the, after the, the SNP majority in 2011, it was obvious there was going to be a referendum. Yeah, I remember that. And I've been, uh, yeah. And uh, I've, I've been an independence guy all my life. My dad used to work for Billy Wolfe, the former leader of the SNP in Bathgate. Guys, I wanted to make a contribution. Obviously, I couldn't go knocking on doors and stuff. So I thought I'll do something. Well, you could knock on the doors and bath. Well, yeah. It was an interesting reception. There's not, not a lot of votes to be won there, though, unfortunately. So, yeah, so I decided to, to do it online. And I tried uh, very briefly. I looked for other Scottish politics websites, and there weren't really any very good ones. I briefly wrote for one that was run by a, a, a variety of people from various parties. But I wrote one article for them and I made a sort of joke in, in one of the comments and was immediately ostracised and disowned. And I thought, oh God, God, I'm going to have to do this myself, aren't I? So yeah, I just started up Wings as a, it was just a little, originally just a short digest of things that were in the Scottish news. And, and why Wings over Scotland? I mean, tell me about the name. I mean, there's kind of symbolism behind it. Some people have said sinister symbolism behind it. So <laughs> I think. What's this Wings issue? It's, I mean, the name, the name just sort of almost happened by accident. I'd always written, my, my very first website when I was a, as a video game writer was called World of Stuart because it, it was a spin, a spoof on World of Sport. We kind of, we edited the, the World of Sport logo with Dickie Davis. And ever since then, I've had blogs uh, that were, that had W-O-S as the initials. There were, there were various permutations of it. The most recent one that I'd had was uh, Wings Over Sealand which you might uh, know is the, the little kind of independent nation just off the, off the coast of Britain by, and it's set up in an old World War II fort, which I've always found a fascinating place. So when I came to write the, the politics blog, it just kind of seemed an obvious progression from Wings Over Sealand to Wings Over Scotland. And what are you consciously, I mean, the purpose of your blog was to uh, rebalance uh, media in the, in the sense that the, the written press uh, in Scotland, some people would argue the television as well, was pretty overwhelmingly biased uh, against Scottish independence. So was your express aim to debunk some of the, the unionist press uh, as well as providing the, the online information that uh, independence supporters needed? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it still is a ridiculous state of affairs where you have a, a political viewpoint held by roughly half of the country, represented by essentially 
Well, certainly at that time, no media at all. There were no newspapers in favour of independence in 2011 when we started. Um, but yeah, the thing that really drove it was when I started to take more of an interest in Scottish politics, which was initially in 2007, but then really in 2011, I was watching these things being written in the newspapers, things on the telly, that I knew for a fact weren't true. And I'm watching and I'm waiting for the journalists or the, the presenters to go, hang on, that's not true. And it never happened. And I couldn't understand why these, these obvious falsehoods weren't being challenged. And it became obvious that, I, yeah, I was, I was going to have to do it myself. I mean, the, the first and most obvious one is the, the myth that Labour can't win a UK election without Scotland. And, and it's, just, it's just not true. It's never been true. It's, it, for, there have been almost no points in history where Labour needed Scottish MPs to have a majority. So this whole thing that Scotland becoming independent would somehow betray the rest of the UK and condemn it to Tory governments forever, it's just, there, there is not the tiniest grain of truth in it. And I couldn't believe that this thing was just being repeated over and over on state broadcasters, on, on national television and in all the papers. So what was, what was your first post on the, the new wings over Scotland when it emerges blinking into the, the sunlight back in 2011? Oh. What was your, your first ever post about? That's a good question. I can't actually remember off the top of my head. I have I've vague notion that it was... Well, I mean, I say we started off just doing a, a digest of what was in the, in the papers, and I, I think it might have had something to do with an Ian McQuirter column, maybe. But it, we really did just start off with here's what's being said in the papers today and here's, you know, what's, what's being discussed and whether it's accurate or not. And what's the, I mean, is, is the Wings entirely your work or do you have a, a list of contributors that you call upon to, to provide a, a different perspective? Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we've had dozens and dozens of contributors over the years. We've had all sorts of people having articles on Wings. We've, we had Douglas Carswell, the UKIP MP. We had Eric Joyce before he kind of moved over from No Yes. We had, a, we had a bunch of politicians with all kinds of, and just ordinary folk, members of the public. So the only sort of uh, regular contributor we have now, apart from myself, is Chris Cairns, our fantastic cartoonist. But yeah, we've, I mean, we've had a, a huge number of, a huge range of people writing for the, for the site over the years. Now, your, your site is always described uh, the, 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 as the controversial wings mm. over Scotland. That's sometimes a lot worse than that. Uh, and usually people point to your use of language, particularly bad language, which, interesting enough, as I can see, is not on the, 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 the site itself, it's on your, your tweeting. That's right, yeah, we don't, so, we don't swear at all on the website. So, firstly, how, how do you defend, uh, firstly, the use of, uh, of language uh, in that way? And isn't it a distraction from... The, the serious message on the on the site. Well, I mean, I always I always find it comical and ridiculous that Scottish people pretend to be offended by a bit of swearing. Who is the most famous, the most celebrated, the most beloved Scottish cultural export of all time? It's Billy Connolly, a man who not only isn't ashamed of swearing, a man who has turned swearing into an art form, and who makes a very strong case, a, a positive case for doing it. Our most, probably our biggest current cultural, uh, uh, certainly entertainment world figure is Frankie Boyle, who is, who is very much the same. We, we celebrate fictional characters like Malcolm Tucker, written by the, the wonderful Armando Iannucci, who is the most magnificent creative swearer in in the history of You're not trying literature. to counterpoint your reverend persona. You're, <laughs> you're the swearing reverend. I don't believe that that we should practice kind of what you, dictionary apartheid. So-called swear words, they're not in a special sealed section at the back of the dictionary with a warning that says not to be used. They're just words. They're words which have a purpose and a use. And if you want to express a certain view, if you're, say, particularly angry about a government policy that is going to cause thousands of people to die, like the most recent welfare reforms, which have, beyond any reasonable doubt, caused thousands or tens of thousands of people to die in early death. How can you express anger, an adequate and sufficient level of anger about that, without using these words? What else are these words for? What about the argument that by using a, a, a range of colourful epithets, you actually allow yourself to be attacked? So you allow 
the unionist press to not address the argument, not to, to, to play the, the ball, but to, to play the person. We say, well, you know, we'll, we can't dismiss his argument, so we'll dismiss him by saying, oh, apart from everything else, he's always uh, foaming at the mouth, swearing at everyone. Well, you know better than, than I do, Alex, that the unionist press will attack you no matter what you do, no matter how nicely you play. Um, so I, I don't, it's not something I've ever allowed to bother me. I, you know, I might as well just be the person I am because I'm going to get attacked anyway. Now, let's go on to the, the referendum proper, uh, where the, the site does something uh, quite, quite extraordinary when you look back on it. You published a, a book. Mm. So, I mean, I, I say it's extraordinary because the fact that you, you've got a, a, a very successful website, a very popular political blog, and then you decide to, 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 to issue a book, a, a, a written form of, uh, of, 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 of what, where did the, the wee blue book come from? The wee blue book was kind of, was basically always the goal from, from very early on. What I realised is that you're going to have a hard time actually winning anyone over with a pro-independence website. Because before they read, ever read your arguments, they've got to come, they've got to want to come to your website and read it. And that's, people tend not to do that that kind of thing if they're opposed to you or if they're or a lot of people just aren't that interested in the internet so what I realized very early on was that I was gonna have to produce something that we could get out and physically put in people's hands people who wouldn't come to a pro-independence website people who wouldn't want to read stuff by me I and mean, also partly because of the stuff that you that you say about being vilified by the unionist press they are you know they were the enemy they weren't gonna give us a fair shout so we had to put something directly into people's hands that we could target and just give the normal man and woman in the street our argument put the best way we could. So the website has always only ever really been a tool for the production of the Wee Blue Book. And the Wee Blue Book was a printed, I mean, you know, the argument in modern politics, so like the Brexiteers and the in the referendum in 2016, they should keep the you know the message as short and simple as possible on the side of a bus. But the people went in totally the opposite direction. You know, how many pages? How many were issued? Yeah, um, well, there were 72 pages. And we put out well between us and some other people, we put out over 300,000 physical copies. There were about 800,000 copies downloaded on uh, people's iPads. And were they bootlegged or were they uh, allowed <laughs> no, to No, we, we, we firmly encouraged people to, to do it every way they could. People, some people printed them out at home, some people printed out giant A4 versions. It was translated into Gaelic, there were audio books of it. We, we absolutely encouraged people to get it out any possible way they could to as many people as they possibly could. But I, I've always, I always found it really offensive that you, that you t t treat people as if they can only understand you know, one sentence of single syllable words. People aren't morons, people want information, they want facts, they want the argument presented to them as if they were intelligent adults, because most people are intelligent adults. And that was, that was always the, the philosophy behind it, is that we are gonna treat people like intelligent adults, we're not gonna bombard them with sound bites and slogans and, and treat them like they're a bunch of performing seals who will just clap their flippers if you give them a snappy enough slogan. So, so that at least hundreds of thousands of, of this uh, political booklet were being released, which is where I became conscious of it. You know, people started to turn up at, uh, at meetings and rallies with the Wee Blue yeah. Book. And, and I've, asked, I've, I've got a video me, of you auctioning a couple at uh, some party event. I did my best. But uh, and, uh, and also asking me about, you know, sort of questions or answers on page 56 or something. And I was, uh, I was meant to automate it, so I had to read it myself to get an impression of it. So uh, do, do you think... It had a, an impact and the, so the Wee Blue was issued when? In the start, towards spring of 2014? We didn't really start getting the print ones into people's hands until the start of September. So that's when the, the, the campaign was coming to its climax? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'd, we'd hoped to get it out sort of in the last month and it took a bit longer to print the number that we were, that we were trying to print. So it was the last sort of two or three weeks that we really started putting them in. So that coincided with a very sharp rise in the, in the polls for the it, Yes campaign. Now, do you attribute it, it, that yeah. to the Wee Blue Book? I, well, I, I, who can say? I, I, I like to think so. I mean, what, what people told us all the time, I mean, people were fighting for copies. We, people had sort of requested five times as many copies as, as we physically had. And what I got told by people over and over again in unsolicited emails and letters and, and all kinds of stuff, 
is that the wee blue book really genuinely changed people's minds. They were saying, I gave this to my, my mum, she was never ever going to vote yes. And then two days later, she was out knocking doors with me. So it, people, like, it quite literally was an eye opener. It, it, it seems to, that's what people tell me, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't there. It wasn't, I didn't, I had no part in the distribution. Uh, my, my, my kind of right hand man, Lindsay Bruce, put together a, just an unbelievable distribution network where we got it to every corner of Scotland from Selkirk to Stornoway and Lerick to Berwick. It went absolutely everywhere. And that, that, the fact that that feat was never recognised anywhere really is something I've still got to be in my bonnet about to that day. The, the fact that nobody, that wasn't considered newsworthy by the mainstream media is, is ludicrous. Now, the, the referendum had famously, you, you predicted the result of the referendum. You estimated the yes support at 45%. Uh, so the referendum was held. Uh, your Wings Over Scotland had been formulated with the, the, the cause of progressing uh, the independence referendum, the yes vote. So the, the votes held, yes get beaten, but Wings Over Scotland continues. Why? Well, I mean, I didn't, I didn't really know. I, I got interviewed by the Sunday Herald uh, in 2014 sometime. And the last question that they, they, they asked me is that as the guy left the room, he said, what, what do you think you would need to keep this going if you don't win. And I said 45%. I said, that's the, the minimum that will keep this, this whole thing alive. And it was alive. Um, but even so, I think I hadn't really considered if we were going to continue afterwards. And it wasn't until, I think it was the day after, when everyone was, was absolutely in, broken. Everybody was in pieces and down. And all the, those loyalist orange thugs appeared in George Square. And I think that that galvanised the Yes movement more than, than I think any amount of sort of talking to ourselves about picking ourselves up and getting back into the fight could have done. I think, I think a huge number of people just went, we are not going to be beaten by these people. And, and there, was a, there was a massive groundswell from Wings readers saying, you can't stop now, you've got to carry on doing this. We are, we are sort of still in this fight. This, this has not been put to bed. And yeah, the, at the end, uh, that, there was just no kind of option but to, but to keep going. So the, the site has carried on and uh, has gone to, uh, from success to success in terms of readers. So how many dedicated readers, isn't that the term they use? Do, do you unique get Unique readers. Yeah. Unique, unique readers. readers is, <laughs> I, 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 I started to get that. How many yeah. unique readers? We're all unique. Have? But no, I mean, well, I mean, it fluctuates. It's been, you know, it's been up and down for, from it peaked at sort of around almost a million in the couple of months reading up to the referendum. But our, our sort of average over the, over the period is about a quarter of a million unique readers every month, which from a country of four million adults is, is a phenomenal reach. It's, I, can't, I still sort of can't quite believe how big it got. I had no imagination that it ever would. And two things, I mean, we're doing, as you know, you're part of a, a series on the top 10 political mm. blogs across these islands. And three of them are either Scottish political blogs or heavily influenced by Scottish mm. politics. Why is it that the Scotland, you know, ten percent of the of the UK population or something like that, has so many blogs in that top ten? What, what is it about Scottish politics that's I been? Mean, whereas there's not been any shortage of excitement in UK politics, yeah. but you can't think of a, a, a specifically orientated, you know, Brexit blog has has achieved that sort of popularity. So, so what is it about Scottish politics that? has got you and the, the others into the top ten? I, I, the most obvious answer, I think, is simply that the, the smaller nations, in particular certain movements within the, the smaller nations of the UK, just aren't served by what we, what we call the mainstream media. They are, there just isn't the coverage. As I said earlier, the, whole, the idea that a viewpoint held by half of the population of Scotland has no significant representation in the media at all it forces people to go elsewhere. They, there's nowhere else to go but online. You can't go out in most of Scotland and, and buy you know, a, a series of newspapers reflecting various viewpoints on independence. You, you, can, you, can, get the main, you can get the unionist view from the, the paper press and from, largely from the broadcasters. And to, get, to have a voice at all for independence, you have to go online. I think it's the same with somebody like Slugger O'Toole in Ireland, to, to, certainly to a large degree, is that these viewpoints just are not represented in the mainstream, and it's, it's the only place that people can go and, and 
talk and gather and find information and arguments. If that's the explanation for the, the preeminence of independence-minded blogs, it's also the explanation for the relative death of, of unionist blogs in Scotland, uh, because they already have <laughs> their viewpoint represented yeah, elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's precisely that. You can, you can get the full range of unionist opinion in newspapers. You can get left-wing unionist opinion, you can get right-wing unionist opinion, centrist unionist opinion, and you can get multiple examples of all of those from the papers. So, yeah, you, you just don't need to go anywhere else. Now, what moves you to, to write a specific piece? I mean, are you reacting to, to some infamy in the, in the union press or some uh, what you regard as a deliberately misleading uh, argument? Or do you, you walk in these, uh, around these wonderful surroundings here in the, in the city of Bath and uh, an idea strikes you from the sky and you say, right, that's going to be my next posting? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of both. It's, it's sometimes... It's reactive, sometimes you know, stuff that is in the press and you go, that, that needs to be corrected. Sometimes we're, we're proactive, sometimes we generate our own uh, content by sort of doing commissioning opinion polls and stuff and writing about the results of those, because I don't think there's nearly enough opinion polling done about Scotland generally, not just politically, but in all kinds of cultural ways. And yeah, sometimes, you know, like I say, sometimes it's just I'm out, I'll be out feeding the squirrels in the park and something will just pop into my head and I go, God, I better go home and write about that in a minute. And what's the, the, the post that you're most proud of? I mean, all, over these last uh, eight years now, uh, what's, uh, what's been the post that you look back and say, yeah, that hit it right in the head? That, well, yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a really hard question. I mean, there's, there's lots of stuff that I think is important and made factual points or got a big audience. But the one that I kind of feel most proud of is the one that I wrote on the day of the referendum itself which was just kind of a, a, a call to arms, tell people to get out and, and get voting. We have a chance to, to do this. Actually, it's, it's something that we don't do a lot. We don't sort of use a lot of kind of bannock burn imagery on the website or something, because not, that's not what independence is about. But we, yeah, we used the quote from Robert, that Robert the Bruce is supposed to have said at Bannockburn, where he says, on them, they fail. But it worked in Bannockburn. It didn't work in the referendum. Well, not yet. Well, Bruce, to be fair, had a few goes at it yeah. before he before he was uh, ultimately successful. And looking back uh, over the many many postings, there's a one you look back and say, nah, "I shouldn't have said that. That that wasn't. I, I didn't. I didn't get it right." Is there anything your mistakes you've made? I don't really regret. No, nothing sort of immediately springs to mind. The the one the one of the first ones that we got that a lot of criticism for was one about the, the now sadly deceased Tory MP Alex Johnson. And he'd issued a, a, a horrible attack on uh, Chris and Colin Weir, the, the, the lottery winners and SNP donors. And I, yeah, I called him, a, I called him quite unpleasant names in that article. It's the only time we've kind of ever really been rude on the website rather than on the Twitter account, which I regard as a, a sort of separate entity. And I don't, really regret it as such and I think it was absolutely fair comment and I don't particularly feel bad about the language either because for the reasons that I sort of said earlier on but it's because it, it sticks out as being the only time really on the website that we've that we've kind of diverged from the policy of keeping the the, the more the ruder knockabout stuff on the Twitter account so I, I suppose if, if you yeah if you were to push me for one that would be the nearest thing. On the subject of fair comment, uh, Kezia Dugdale famously won a, a case she brought against her for defamation, although it was accepted by the, uh, the judge that, uh, uh, that you, you had been defamed mm. because you're not homophobic. Uh, but nonetheless, she won the case on the, the grounds of fair comment. It was not a bit a daft thing to do of a, a you know, controversial blogger, someone who at least tweets uh, in pretty strong and offensive terms, uh, to take a, a, a politician to task uh, for, um, we might argue, doing something similar to you. I, well, I, I would firmly disagree that it's something similar. I mean, if Kezia Dugdale had written an article saying she thought I was a, a horrible human being, I, I would. she's perfectly entitled to hold that opinion. I have no, no beef with that. If you, Again, you'll know better than I do that how much abuse you get if you're involved in politics. I get called awful things a hundred times a day. But there is a, there's a difference, not only morally, but in law, between being unpleasant about someone and defaming them by saying things that are factually untrue. She can, she can think I'm horrible, 
that's her, she's entitled to have that opinion. She's not entitled to say that I hate gay people because I don't hate gay people. That is an, an outrageous thing to say. And in retrospect, uh, knowing what you know now that you, you lost the case, albeit having your reputation uh, underlined as not being a homophobe, uh, in terms of the judgment, uh, do you regret doing it? No, I mean that that in a in a sense was the important thing. I mean, on obviously we lost the case, although we may still appeal it. But what was important to me was to was to establish that you that you couldn't smear not only me but uh, people in the independence movement generally who are often smeared in in horrible terms by the press or by unionist politicians. And I, I you've got to take a stand at some point. At some point. If you let people abuse you like that, you lose the right to defend your reputation, legally speaking. So I wanted to clearly have it established and have, have it in writing, as it were, that I am not a homophobe, that I wasn't tweeting homophobic things, and that people cannot say that. And in, in that sense, we won the case. That fact has been established. It has been established that it is defamatory to call me a homophobe. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's been, Expensive. It's defamatory, but it's fair comment. Yeah. Well, fair comment is a is a, a term which doesn't necessarily mean comment which is fair. So how about the argument that we, we see just now that some people argue that uh, Wings Over Scotland, uh, other uh, bloggers, uh, the the online advance of the nationalist or independence cause is to the SNP's detriment. Some people say. Uh, that the association with, uh, with controversial bloggers and uh, controversial language actually harms the, the, the independence cause. Well, do you have any, well, I don't think you've got any sympathy with that argument, <laughs> but can you see what people are driving at, or do you think it's just part of the tactics of uh, politics? Well, I mean, it certainly is that. It's certainly a, an attempt at divide and rule. But I mean, we've always been incredibly clear on wings that we have no connection to the SNP. I've never been in the SNP. I've never voted for the SNP, even though I... I did before I left Scotland. I, there were elections that I could vote in, and I didn't vote for the SNP in them. We have nothing to do with the SNP. So, certainly, I don't see how it can, it ought, oughtn't to damage the SNP. Nicola Sturgeon is, is not responsible for me, and I've never suggested it should be. I mean, if anyone's responsible for me, it's probably Willie Rennie, because I've always been a Lib Dem voter. <laughs> I, uh, and is this a, a revelation you're making in the Alex Salmon show? Or, <laughs> no, no, or, this is, we, we've this said is this established. From, the, from the start, because Bath is a, is a Lib Dem Tory marginal. And I came down here when uh, Chris Patton was the MP when I arrived here. And the first election I ever voted in, we kicked him out. And Bath has been Lib Dem, with the exception of uh, the 2015 election, a Tory got in, but then we kicked him back out in 2017. So yeah. So so what we're basically saying is that if any political party reputation is at risk from the the more uh, florid style of wings over Scotland, then it's the Liberal Democrats. Absolutely, yeah. I'm afraid I'm afraid I'm on their hands. <laughs> now, where do you see the national movement going? I mean, your continuing popularity is vouched for. Well, in the success of your your recent fundraiser, I mean. Oh. Uh, you're, uh, you have many, many loyal supporters who are desperate to see the, the site continue. But where, where do you see the direction of the, of the independence campaign? Goodness, that's, a, that, that's quite a question. Um, I, I, I really don't know is the answer. I mean, everything in, the, in British politics is, is so up in the air at the moment that I don't think anyone can predict with any degree of, of accuracy where, where any of it's going to end up now. I'm really driving it as you, know, you wanted to make a contribution to the referendum uh, and then you saw uh, a continuing hope because of the closeness of the result and because of the desire of people to continue the argument. But do you actually regard yourself as a practitioner making a contribution or are you a, a, a commentator whose principal purpose is to, to debunk unionism and the unionist press? Well, I mean, obviously it is both of those. I, I primarily do see myself as a participant. I, you know, Wings makes no pretense of being a neutral observer in the independence campaign. We are a pro-independence website. So as a pro-independence website, therefore you must have a, a view on the direction that the independence campaign should take. Well, I mean, I've, we've said on Wings for, for some time now that the SNP, probably the Scottish government, however you want to put it, should probably have been more proactive in the last few years. I personally would very much have liked to have seen a, a court challenge 
with regard to whether we need a Section 30 order or not to hold a referendum, because there's a great deal of learned legal opinion on both sides of that argument. It has in no way been... The Edinburgh Agreement, which you signed, as you know, did not settle that issue. It kind of moved it to one side and said, we, will, we are having a referendum now. And is that wish based on what you believe the mood is in Scotland, or is it based on the, the disarray in, uh, in Westminster? Um, again, it, it's a little of both. I mean, it's, it, it's very much the mood that I detect in, in the grassroots movement from people who talk to me every day, who are, who are becoming... Who a lot, most people have understood that the Scottish government's policy has to sort of essentially sit back and wait for Brexit to unfold one way or another. But the people, I think, have are increasingly unhappy that more active steps haven't been taken to prepare ourselves for when that day comes. Because that day could come uh, any minute now, really, any time between now and, and this October or even later than that. But it could be very soon. And I think a lot of people would like something to have been done to, estab to, to put it in the Scottish government's hands. I think it's all very well saying Nicola Sturgeon hasn't called a referendum yet because she wants to see what Brexit is doing. But it's not her decision at the moment. We, have, we don't have the power to do it and we, we won't be able to clearly have that power unless it is estab either established legally or something political happens and every day that we delay is another, another day that this isn't going through the Supreme Court or wh wherever. And, and I don't think we have all that much time to, to waste anymore. But, but surely the SNP leadership's points are a very fair one, that um, they uh, don't have within their gift the right for Section 30. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon has ruled out an uh, 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 unofficial referendum or a, uh, a Catalonian-style uh, initiative. Uh, what are the options then? Isn't she and the leadership perfectly correct? So we just have to bide our time and wait for something else to happen. Well, this is the problem. And if you if you rule out all of those options, and the UK government just keeps saying now is not the time forever, you, you've got nowhere. There's nowhere else to go. It just it will never happen, and and we'll all grow old and die before we ever have a second independence referendum. So there are only two avenues that I can see. One of them being an, an arrangement with perhaps a Labour government that doesn't have a majority and would be prepared to concede a referendum in exchange for support, or we go the legal route. I, I don't think the strategy of just asking over and over again until they, until they cave in out of the kindness of their hearts is ever going to get us anywhere. A referendum's been a relatively recent innovation in SNP policy. I, I sort of remember since I, I brought it in. Mm. Uh, couldn't the SNP go back to saying a mandate from a, a general election or a Scottish election, or from a majority of MPs. I mean, you, I mean, you can try it, but it doesn't. It, it might carry moral force, but it doesn't carry a lot of legal force. And I think what we've seen from the UK government in the last couple of years, particularly, is that they are enormously resistant to any kind of moral force argument. They will only do stuff that that we force them to do you know look at how Theresa may is clinging on to the door of 10 downing street by her her fingernails and her teeth she is only going to be prized out of there by by wild horses mm. but and she it, will be prized out <clears throat> and at some point and even margaret thatcher in her autobiography the downing street years wrote how she would respect a, a mandate of a majority of uh, of mps from the snp or do you think she was bluffing I, I think, well, that would, have been, that would have been a very interesting thing to see if it had happened then. I, I think things have changed too much now. I think the existence of the Scottish Parliament and things like that make that very difficult now. And also, we have to be honest when we say you can... The SNP got, in 2015, 95% of Scottish MPs on 50% of the vote. Repeating that 50% of the vote would be very difficult. I think it's very difficult to say we've got a majority of the MPs on a minority of the vote and therefore we have a moral mandate. I, I, don't, I, I think that's a difficult sell. I, you could I'm have not, a mandate to negotiate. But yeah, I mean, you have a mandate to ask is, is all you really have from that. So, no, I think the, the way that it was handled in 2014 was the best way for 2014. We, we got them to agree. But their viewpoint now is that, okay, we gave, we gave you that, 
we, we let you have a go, you lost, now you have to shut up forever. And if that is their position and they stick to that position, and I see no sign that they're gonna ever vacate that position in the, in the foreseeable future, then we have to accept that, that being reasonable isn't going to work, just making a case isn't going to work. So you're for a, an unofficial uh, plebiscite, but I mean, that, that sort of thing hasn't worked enormously well in Catalonia. Yeah, no, I'm not in favour of a sort of a wildcat referendum per se, for, for exactly the reasons you say, and because uh, councils would just refuse to cooperate with it, it wouldn't happen, unionist voters would boycott it. If you're going to go down that route, then what you have to do is sort of nominally instigate it and at which point it will be challenged by someone in the courts and then you take it through the courts so that either the court rules that Holyrood can hold a referendum anytime it wants which is the, the best outcome obviously or it is finally laid down that, that that is not a route that Scotland can pursue and that gives us it gives us a political weapon for a start but then that would also help to to revalidate the other arguments you're suggesting. Because if we are not allowed to hold a referendum by that legal route, then you can start to make the case that, okay, well, we have to have some way of exercising self-determination. Therefore, maybe a majority of MPs is the way to go forward. So one way or another, you're determined that the, the game should be afoot once again in Scotland. Uh, another referendum, another test. So can we anticipate another wee blue book? Oh, you certainly can, yeah. I mean, that's the, again, that's still the whole point of kind of Wings Over Scotland is to, is to get to a, a referendum and have another, put another wee blue book in people's hands that we will be printing this time sort of four to five times as many as we did the last time. Because I, I think it is very powerful to give people facts. That's the thing that we do at Wings Over Scotland above anything else. You don't have to take our word for anything. We admit up front that we are biased, that we are pro-independence, but every claim that we make, every fact that we assert, we give you a, the source, we give you the link, we say Here's, here are the facts, you go and look at them, don't take our word for it, decide for yourself whether we are telling you the truth or not. Because the mainstream media has no interest in doing that. Mainstream media, even online, never links to things. If they go, oh there's been a report or a survey or a study, they will tell you what they want you to think it said. They won't give you the link to go and read that thing for yourself. That's what we do. We say, these are the facts. We're putting a spin on them, but if you don't trust our spin, go and see for yourself. So you would regard yourself as almost mirror image of the, the mainstream media. I mean, many publications pretend not to have a, an opinion. Many admit to one, but many more say, oh, well, we'll decide when the election comes or whatever. But then present arguments which uh, as facts which are actually actually their spin without mm. fact checking. Whereas you do the opposite. You declare your your colours, nail them to the mast, but your arguments are all fact checked, so people can source for themselves whether they're true or false. It's a, yeah, I, I couldn't put it better myself. It's it's precisely that. We we come straight up in your face and go, we are completely biased. You're a blog version of Call My Bluff, basically. <laughs> that's, that's a fair enough way of putting it, yeah. But Except we don't do any bluffs. So with your, your colours nailed to the mast, you've got an incredibly loyal and very substantial Scottish audience. Do you, do you get much traffic from Firth of Scotland, from out with Scotland? Can, can you measure these things up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we get fairly detailed stats from our web post. It's, it's a 10 to 15% of our traffic is, is from outside Scotland. Most of that is... Uh, London area. So we get a fair amount of readership from kind of, you know, within the heart of political power in the UK as well as in Scotland. But yeah, we're primarily Scottish interest. And do most uh, MSPs or MPs, do they, they glance at wings either for or against you, either to get ammunition or, or indeed to, to look for things they can criticise? There's you're quite a lot, yeah. I think roughly, I think half of the SNPs, MSPs and MPs follow my Twitter account. Quite a few unionist politicians follow my Twitter account as well and, and unionist figures and uh, a, lot, a lot of journalists do and, uh, and, and quite a lot of them block us as well on both sides of the debate because we're, we're just too vile to be seen to interact with. So this career that you've effectively carved out for yourself over the last seven years, when back in the, the day when you were a, a, a lad in Bathgate, did you think you were going to be a political controversialist or did you have something else in mind? <laughs> no, I, when, I, when I left school, I was 17 or 18, I had no clue what I wanted to do. And I, I ended up at university as it happened. I'd never thought about it before. But in between times, um, I applied for just a bunch of various jobs with no 
real sort of particular aim where I was going. And uh, true story, uh, I was offered a job in the, the UK diplomatic corps at the age of about 19. I had, a, I had an interview in St Andrew's house not long before I went to university. And it was a, it's a junior position, obviously, an entry level position, but it was the first step on the rung to being a, an ambassador, a, a British ambassador. So, uh, so I, I could have been the ambassador to, to some, uh, some far-flung country and we would probably have had quite a few more wars. So, so the, the Foreign Office could have had another Craig Murray on their hands. Well, it wasn't, wasn't one enough for them? <laughs> I, 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 I think they would have rapidly come to that conclusion, yeah. So the, what you're telling us, uh, Stuart, is that the Wings Over Scotland, Scotland's most controversial, most successful uh, political blog, uh, a man who has irritated more politicians than, uh, than any newspaper on the planet, or any journalist even, uh, could have been Her Majesty's ambassador to some far-flung area. I, I could have been our man in Moscow <laughs> to this day. And who would he have been representing? <laughs> there are, I think you would get a, a, mixed, uh, a mixed answer to that depending on who you ask. And my very last question, Stuart. <coughs> You, you've set your sights on another test of, the, of uh, Scottish opinion, achieved one way or another. Uh, and you see that coming soon, and therefore Wings Over Scotland has a, a, a drive and a determination to be part of, that, uh, part of that argument. Have you thought about success and post-independence? Would you be back to Scotland? Would you give up political controversy, or would you enter mainstream politics? What, what, what have you got in mind for, for Stuart Campbell in the future? Yeah, I mean, I've always said that I would move home if we, if we got independence, I'd move home permanently. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm torn from day to day about whether that would be to form a new political party or to go and live in a cave with no internet for the rest of my life. I'm sure you're going to be taking over from Willie Rennie as a, <laughs> as a convinced Liberal Democrat voter here. Well, I think somebody needs to. <laughs> Stuart Cavill, I can't uh, assure you of a, a political career, but what I can do is present you with the, the Alex Salmon Quay for appearing on the show. Now, you know the drill. There's no, even here in Bath, you'll be able to get your uh, hands on a good scotch and only scotch. Indeed, well. Thank you very much, Alex. Great pleasure, Stuart. Thank you. Watch the Alex Salmon Show on air and online 24-7.